Tonight we're going to be working on a couple different uh, chapters in our book. And when I say in our book, I actually mean the bonus chapters from our book. So the, the textbook that we have has, I think, 33 or 34 uh, printed chapters, like physical chapters. Uh, but the author um, for the book wrote several others that I don't know if he shuffled in and out of the book or what his deal is, but I took all those bonus chapters and there's on the resources page right at the top. So the ones we're working on tonight are Servlets and JSP, chapter 37 and 38. And you're going to see that the files, when you open them up, they don't look like our textbook. Those are These are like the raw files that are fed into the textbook. So the topics in this unit, uh, which are servlets and Java server pages, are two of the techniques that we can use to push server-side Java code to a web browser. And both techniques are very heavily used out in the field. Um, Java and Oracle, who runs Java, is really pushing things towards people using Java server faces. That's really the new, you know, forward-moving technology. But as with many technologies, when people put large projects into effect, and, you know, for example, Blackboard that we're using right now, this runs on Java server pages. It's a JSP website. That means we have a big database somewhere, and we have all this Java code sitting on a server, and then we do stuff on the screen, it runs certain code on the server, and then it pushes back HTML pages to us. So it's done with Java server pages. All right, so, um, so two very important technologies. They both operate a little bit differently. They're different than what we've seen with um, Java server faces, but you're going to see that there's also commonalities. Servlets is a little bit more like Java server faces, and JSP is a little bit more like ASP and PHP. So if you're comfortable with PHP and ASP, you guys will totally jump right into JSP uh, real quickly. And uh, the few of you here that I know are also doing my Ruby class right now, or maybe you guys have had Ruby before, you're also going to see some commonalities when we get to JSP with the delimiter tags that they use to wrap JSP commands because they're the same. You know, they really come from the same place. All right. I also have a little note here in the course shell about the software we need to use in order to make this happen. You can absolutely do any of this stuff in any good Java IDE, even JGrasp. You, know, you guys remember we were using that program? Or if you use BlueJ or something like that, those will all work with this technology. Uh, but for my money, the easiest one to do this like server-side Java stuff with is NetBeans because it, it's integrated very nicely into the environment. There's not a lot of configuration that you have to do. If you choose to do it with uh, Eclipse, you have to have, make sure that you have the Java EE version, not the SE version, which we originally started with. You also have to make sure that you have all the server-side stuff installed and all the plugins that go with it. For me, it's kind of a, like a configuration nightmare, frankly, and that's why I don't like to teach with it, because then we spend all this time configuring and not doing code. Um, all right, so that aside, even when you're using NetBeans, you can run into some issues, because whenever we're executing code and it pushes to a browser, we also have to run a web server uh, in order to push it to the browser. Glassfish is the default these days for NetBeans. It used to be Tomcat. Now Tomcat, for, by a lot of people's standards, is probably the more important product in, it, in the field it actually is. But we're doing development work. We really don't care what server we're pushing it to at this point. Um, so for all intents and purposes, we're going to work just like we did with Java server faces, and that is we're just going to use Glassfish to be the web server. That's the default. That's what we're going to go with. There are certain configuration environments, meaning like whatever wi version of Windows you're running, the version of Java you're running, uh, you know, the updates and plugins and all that kind of stuff you do in your operating system, your browser versions, all this like these variables that come into play that might make it so that Glassfish does not work for you. Okay, If that is the case, that's the scenario in which you switch to Tomcat. 
Tomcat's not hard to work with in NetBeans because really all you have to do is have the executable that runs Tomcat and you point to it and then NetBeans takes care of the rest. I don't anticipate that's going to be our scenario here though. So I just point that out because you should know about it. Um, and the other thing that you should know as well is if you've installed this product here, XAMPP or XAMPP or whatever people call it, which is a local web server that you can run that offers Tomcat capabilities within it. So when you point NetBeans to Tomcat, you just find the folder within uh, XAMPP and then boom, it goes. All right. There's uh, also a link here uh, as well to my Google Drive folder where there is source code for chapters 37 and 38, and those are that's the source code for the example files in the chapter. Okay. Um, I know at the moment, at least as I'm recording this, that the chapter 38 video seemed to not be working again. I thought I corrected it the other day, but I, I plan on fixing it hopefully before the night is through. So probably by the time you watch this video, they'll be working again. Um, and then our other goal here is to get through both of these exercises tonight and both of the chapters. I'm not digging real deep into either one because really at this point, what you're going to realize is we're looking at how these technologies fundamentally work. And then all the rest of it really is regular Java coding. It's just using it in a different format. And once you understand the format, it really shouldn't be that long before you go running with it. All right. That formal stuff aside, let's go ahead and dig into chapter 37. So if you open up the, the chapter, the bonus chapter, this is what it's going to look like. Notice it looks a little bit more plain than what your textbook has. Uh, this is basically like a raw text file of sorts. And what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to kind of very quickly skim the beginning and walk you guys through creating a servlets uh, application and getting it to work. Once we have it working, we are going to code the exercise and we'll be done with the chapter. We're not going much deeper. It's almost the end of the semester here. So, all right. So, part of the point here of working with servlets, um, like JSF, and you're going to see with JSP, is that we can write Java code. Obviously, it pushes to the browser, and that that's our objective overall. But servlets op operate similar to an older technology called CGI, which stands for Common Gateway Interface. And that was an old way we used to run server-side code. And really, what, in those days, what we did is we would write scripts in, in like Perl or Python or something like that that we'd run on the server. And then we'd run a CGI interface that would trigger the code, does a bunch of stuff, once again, write HTML for us and push back to the browser. But that's a way old school approach, and it's, for most intents and purposes, it's dead. You know, uh, it's still out there, but people really don't develop for it anymore. All right, so servlets is kind of a replacement uh, for that. All right, so what kind of stuff can you do? Well, you can do all sorts of stuff. I mean, you guys have seen the kind of programs that you can operate. One of the reasons why we operate server-side code is to protect that code from the users. Web browsers, if you're doing stuff in like JavaScript, for example, users can see the code, right? And sometimes you need to have this code on the server so that the code can talk to the database and other applications and other servers to make things happen. So that's why we even bother to write code like this. All right, in the old days when we would do the CGI stuff, very often you would see URLs that look like this. So you'd have like a, a domain name, and then often you'd see CGI bin because that's usually where the, where the scripts were located. And then you'd send instructions in the form of a get. And you guys, HTML people, you should know what that means. That means when you do something on a form and you hit a button and you submit, that whatever you're sending to the server is visible in the URL. And usually you can denote that by seeing that there's a question mark in it, and then equal signs and plus signs and ampersands. It just shows you key value pairs and the actual application that's being called. Now, that's a messy URL and not very friendly to work with. One nice thing about working with servlets is that you get these clean-looking URLs. 
That's an important thing too, because it also helps to hide the file and folder structure from people. Now, even though a hacker, for example, might not be able to access your server to get to this file called git balance CGI, he knows what it's called. You see the problem there? So if he can just finagle his way onto the server somehow, he already knows what file to attack. If you write an application that's built with like servlets, it may or may not match the name of the file, and even if it does, it's a little bit more convoluted of a structure to try to hack. So in, in essence, it's also a little bit more secure. Um, all right. You can see I'm racing ahead here. So here's an example of what a servlet looks like. So in, in very much like other Java applications, we have all the standard type of structures. We, you know, we package declaration if appropriate, some imports, and then the big class structure that we are fitting into. Notice that we are extending the HTTP servlet. So we're pulling in from this big construct. And then there's a couple of things that you're just basically going to include in all of your applications. And, and part of that is the, the fact that we're doing a re, uh, servlet request and a response. And then we also set up exception handling so that if there's some sort of a problem interfacing with the server or with the code running, then, you know, the, the whole thing doesn't break, you know. Usually then you would write some sort of a, a thing that would say, hey, it's not working, and you push it back to the browser. You don't want it just to stop. Um, so those parts basically, um, you know, basically from here on up, this is stuff that's going to appear basically in all those servlet applications one way, shape, form, or another, you know, maybe name different things, but basically those things are going to be there. Notice that once we actually get moving with the code, though, the technique here, we're doing out. Now, I know, like, your old school Java, when you st first started learning, we did system out. Here we're just doing out, and then we're still doing a print line. And notice what we're printing out. We're printing out HTML. So this code's going to run, and what it's going to do is it's going to output a web page and send it to the browser. Right, so this is pretty simplistic because these are just output statements. But the next step from this would be we can write regular Java code, do math, concatenate strings, whatever it is that you do with Java. And then you can take the output of that and feed it into one of these out statements and then push it to the browser. So you see how that works? Okay, a little fuzzy, I get it. But um, when you see it in action, I hope it makes a little bit of sense. So what we're going to do next is we're going to follow these steps here for creating a really simple little application and getting it to work. That in and of itself is an accomplishment. And the one thing you shouldn't do, preferably, is race ahead. Okay, I know the temptation is there, but uh, stick with me, because I can tell you right when we get to step three, we're not doing what he says. <laughs> All right, so I mean, right from that point. Um, and I know this, you know, trust me, from experience over and over again. And when they put glass fish into net beans, and it's a default, and it just works, and it works a lot more smoothly than Tomcat, in my opinion. Um, it's a it's a great thing. Um, I've spent um, I can't tell you how many hours in certain situations trying to get Tomcat to run on servers. Um, it's not really a, you know I'd rather go to the dentist basically. <laughs> it's it's like one of those kind of things. All right, <clears throat> maybe it's easier these days, so I shouldn't knock it so much, but. It kind of has a reputation for being problematic at times. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, fire up NetBeans. And I, I will be bopping back and forth to those instructions, but for right now, I'm going to pull them off to my second screen here uh, just so I can see them while I'm talking to you. Uh, and if you need to have them up on the screen for yourself, uh, please do. Not a bad way to work. Once you go dual screen, you never go back. But if you go triple screen, it's hard to go back to two. All right, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new project. So you can go to File, 
new project. We do still want to have a Java web application. So Java web on this side, web, web application on the right side. I'm going to try to go slow here. You guys all look like you're with me, so I'm going to proceed. Uh, and the next step here, the guy wants us to call it Liang Web, which is the guy's last name, right? Uh, you don't have to call it that. I'm going to call mine, uh, you should start probably with a capital, Chapter 37. Servlet. That's what I'm going to call mine. All right, I already have a project location. That's the, the working folder I've been using the whole semester. And if you guys are all good with that, go ahead and click Next. Now here's where my instructions will start to differ from the book. So we're on step three in the instructions, and it said select Apache Tomcat, which you can. But I'm going to select it, and then I want you to notice um, that it might not necessarily work just because I'm picking it. Okay? Sometimes we have to go into the properties and point it to the right spot. Please choose Glassfish. Okay? The book also tells you that in this spot, you should choose Java EE5. Guess what? No. Choose Java EE7. Choose the latest version. The EE after Java stands for Enterprise Edition. When we learn Java initially, we always work with the Standard Edition, which doesn't have some of the database capabilities and these web capabilities, too. So, uh, real developers use Java EE. So are we. All right, click Next. On this last page, you don't have to click any of these choices. Go ahead and click Finish. Now it's going to go through the process of creating the framework for your project, so you can see that it generated all this stuff. And as you should get in the habit of doing, is you should explore it. So you can see we still have the web page section. There's an index file. That's what opens up here by default. If you want to ex explore it, there's nothing weird about it at all. It's just an HTML file, right? There's no Java code in it, no weird little hashtags or Java directives. It's just an HTML file. Uh, in the source packages folder, that's where we're going to be putting our code. Okay. So that's the next step that we are up to right now. All right, so now um, we're moving on to the next set of instructions. So if you're curious as to where I am, I'm just below these images working on this section. And my PDF says it's page 8. All right, so now we're going to come up here. We're going to right-click the project node that we just created. And what we're going to do is choose New, and then we're going to find Servlet. Remember, if it's not in the list, go to Other at the bottom and search for it. Okay. The way that this program works is the stuff you use most often will just bubble up to the top. All right, so now we need uh, a new uh, servlet name. The author is choosing first servlet. I'm going to be a little bit more clever than that. I'm going to say whatever. If you guys have had my classes before, you know that's one of my favorites. And got our project, got our source packages. I don't think we need to do anything else except for maybe include a package name. Why not, right? Let's just do, uh, how about CHAP37, upper lowercase does not matter. All right. If you've got this stuff entered in, we're going to move on to the next tab. I'm going to hit next. And there's this checkbox right here. It says, add information to deployment descriptor. 
and you'll see that we'll basically be creating a file called WebXML. And this is, um, I'm trying to think of what a good name for this file is. Basically, it's kind of like a manifest of sorts. It helps to kind of keep track of project resources. Uh, and it really is one of those things that helps us really make that transition from like we're creating web pages with server-side code to like we're writing an application. Because one of the definitions for an application is it gets bundled together and it has def definitions and manifests and all that kind of stuff that goes with it. All right. And then for those, you should be able to just leave everything fine just the way it is and then click finish. And you have a new file. Sorry, so we were supposed to check that? Yes, check that box on the last screen. Uh-oh. Well, we can do that again, right? All right, the next set of instructions, I'm going to pull them back over here. It says to go to listing 37.1 and copy the code and paste it in. So 37.1 is this. So you guys see what this says? Right. Okay. You guys are going to discover you can't copy paste this stuff. Now, if if you do have the source code downloaded, you can go to the book source code and download this and open it. Um, but if you actually take a look at what's going on here and the whole reason why why we are even running this is just just see that it runs. You get my drift here. It doesn't really matter what we're running. The whole point is, does it work? So our goal then is just to get this to run. We don't really need to change this stuff at all. All right. So now we're going to jump up to the root of our project right here. Right. And we're going to get it to run. But first things first, come over to this little icon here. You can see how mine is like blue, which means it's going to use the IDE's default browser, which guess what is... Internet Explorer. No, thank you. Let's use Chrome instead. Or whatever you choose. So I'm going to choose Chrome. And then I'm going to come back here, root of the project, right click, run. That will initiate Glassfish. You'll see Glassfish starting. And since it's our first run, it'll be the slowest to start. Got to launch a whole piece of software. You can see it's deploying. And here we are. It's running. This is exciting, right? But here's the thing. What we're actually running here isn't the application. We are running the web page. So if I look at the index page, you can see to do supply a title, to do write content, right? So to do write content, to do supply a title. See that? And then take a look at the URL real carefully. Notice it doesn't say index.html. It says the name of the application that we created. Okay, Ruby on Rails people and ASP.NET MVC people. Kind of looks familiar. Clean URLs, right? The same kind of thing going on here. You know, we're not pointing to files. We're pointing to application structure at this point. But we need to run a file called whatever I called mine. What did I call mine? Whatever. Okay. You probably called yours what the book told you to call it. So I'm just going to type whatever to the end of the URL, and it is launching that servlet file. And I can verify that because if I look at it and I look at the output, it's saying servlet whatever at, and it says request get context path. So it's just giving me the path of the application. That's all it's doing. But it is running. Okay? So we have successfully deployed a servlet. Now, if, if you're thinking about how this works now, you can write any Java code you want in any fashion you want, like 
maybe a your vote counts application and any time that you're going to do output to the screen so like if you wrote your like application in regular java that output to the console anywhere that you would do a system out print line you would just do an out print line to an html construct that's appropriate for whatever you're doing make sense of course it takes a little bit of planning but really what it's showing you is that in many ways you can just grab all that your vote count stuff bring it in and then you're just changing output statements I'm not saying it's necessarily super easy, but it's totally doable. And you guys have the skill to do it at this point. I have every confidence that you do. You, you can figure your way through it. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause the video. We're going to take a breath. And then we're going to come back and do the exercise. And, fin and then we're going to call this chapter done. All right, so now that we've gotten that first part to successfully work, we're going to shift into the exercise. So the exercises, of course, are near the bottom of our chapter, if I can get to them. There's our summary. And the assignments. Now... What's really cool about the assignments for 37 and 38, we've kind of already done this assignment. So the beauty is our logic for figuring out a factorial, that's done. We just have to convert it to this new format. So um, we're doing exactly what we did before. This is going to be our desired output. So what I'm going to do, and I have done already, is basically I brought up in my notepad plus plus here somewhere. And, okay, here it is. This is my code from exercise 33.1 where we first did the factorial. And we have this whole thing here where we have the logic that c computes and displays the factorial. And really the, the work is being done basically in this little method right that's the factorial logic itself and then in the for loop because it has to run a certain number of times right so those are the two key pieces of logic that we already have created we don't have to reinvent the wheel so now our goal is to switch that over and get it into our application so I'm gonna um, start to tweak um, or actually, you know what, I'm going to create a, a file from scratch. So I'm going to create a new servlet. So I'm going to right click the project node, new servlet, and I'm just going to call it factorial. The package name, I'm going to use the package name I've already created, which is CHAP37. And once you have that typed in, you can proceed to the next tab. You guys good? Next, <laughs> next tab here, or next uh, screen, make sure you check the box and then click finish. You guys are making fun of me and I am on to it. Now immortalized in video. All right, so now we have basically the basic structure of our application here uh, and all the stuff we need. We are gonna keep all this uh, HTML doc type stuff at the top, right? No reason that needs to change. Uh, we won't need this. That's superfluous. We will need the closing body and HTML tags. The one thing that we need to think about, though, as we are thinking about what we did before, and I guess what I'm going to do here is I'll pull this onto the screen for just a moment and just take a look at our logic, because really, in this older example, 
we used a different approach to push the HTML to the browser, right? We wrote a string and we concatenated to it, saved it into that string variable, and then eventually output the string, right? That was our approach. Here we're going to do it by out print line. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start converting this stuff into this. That, that's my objective here. So I'm going to actually like do a little split screening here and do a little copying. And it looks like I can use my screen space mostly efficiently. And so I'm just going to start typing out the print line. And so help me out here. What should my first line here be? I got an idea. What about table? Oh, it should be tags, all right. Table. And I'm just going to use the same code. Border equals, why am I putting a slash here? an escape character and actually since I'm using single quotes I technically don't need it or do I well I just want to show you you know that you have this is like little minutiae kind of stuff that you do have to keep in mind as you're coding um, all right so that's one statement and let's put a semicolon at the end. Oh, we need to close the HTML too, don't we? Close the tag. That looks good. And let's do a semicolon. Once again, out that print line. And then we're going to do a TR. Out print line. We'll do the same thing we did here, TD. In fact, I can save myself some typing. I don't know why I'm being so silly about this. A little copy-paste. That's a closing TR. And now we're getting to the point where we need to recreate the loop. Right? Well, here's the beauty of it. We can actually just grab this whole loop as is. I'm just going to drop it right in. Now, it, it's screaming at us a little bit because i got a variable name here that I'm not, I haven't declared. But don't worry about that. We'll fix that. Instead of doing this, for all of these, we're just going to do out print line. Same logic. And so if you see the pattern of what I'm doing here, you can just very quickly and easily yourself start converting these statements. Now, it is going to squawk at us a little bit about this compute factorial because I haven't copied that method over yet, so don't worry about that. And one last one here. Same logic, different architecture. Really not that much different, right? I mean, it's not really that far off, and it's not hard to understand. We're just outputting using a different approach. We're interspersing it with regular Java code. 
This is just a for loop. It's going to run a certain number of times. We know the logic works. We've tested it in another place. And while you're thinking about that in terms of problem solving, a lot of programming is done in the fashion where people will write simple little programs that they'll output to the console, right, or some other construct they've already created, just to get the logic. And once you have the logic, well, now I got the logic. I can pick it up from any Java program in any format and move it to any other format, tweak the syntax a little bit, and kaboom, it's working. See the beauty of that? All right, so the last thing that we need to do is we need to add the method for compute factorial. So I'm going to just copy, come down here and copy this. And that's going to sit just inside the closing curly bracket. Now, I do want you to take note of the fact that at the bottom here, you see this little thing It says, HTTP servlet methods, click on the plus sign to edit the code. So this is the stuff that's automatically dropped in by the, the structure that we've built. Typically, you never need to look at it, but sometimes you're doing custom stuff and you need to adjust it. All right, so now we got that method dropped in. I'm not really quite sure what happened there. All right. There we go. It's a weird double screen thing going on. And there it is again. Oh, I see. It's because I'm hovering over this and it all pops up. All right. Now, with our original version, we did a return statement because we had to send that back to Java server faces or whatever application we were building. Here we don't need to do that because we're directly outputting the HTML. This should be it. This program is done. So control S to save. And then we should be able to run our application. And actually, if I haven't killed my application from before, it's still running. I can make sure by just doing a refresh. And then what I'll do here with the URL is I'm going to change it from whatever to factorial and our work is complete. That is assignment 37-1 or 37.1. All right, this video is going to end here and then I'll go around and help everybody make sure that they're getting theirs working too.